It is my honor and my privilege to welcome our speaker tonight. He was a friend, he is a friend, and he will forever be my friend. I have watched him now going on two and a half years, work harder than any man I know. And Pastor Manny, I want you to know that this church family appreciates your labor of love to our children and to our teenagers. Can you do me a favor, clap a little louder, go ahead and add a shout to that voice, and welcome to this platform, Pastor Emmanuel Gonzalez. Oh, come on, while you have those hands together, give God one more big praise. If he's healed you, praise him. If he's delivered you, praise him. If he's done anything in your life, just as Elder G would say, take 15 seconds right now and give God praise. If you're thankful for a church like this, then give God a big old shout. If you're thankful for a pastor that stands in truth, give God a big old shout. If you're thankful for the brother or the sister on your left or your right, because if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't have your breakthrough. Give God a shout. Turn around to somebody, give them a high five and say, my God is in the room tonight. You may find yourself a seat this evening. I'm telling you what, I'm glad to be in a great Bible-believing, Holy Ghost-filled, demon-stomping church that shakes the gates of hell, that sees the miraculous, not just hears about it, but sees the tangible presence of God. I'm thankful that we have a place like this one that we can gather together and believe God for the extraordinary. I feel the Holy Ghost in the room tonight. Now, May 31st, I know it's not Memorial Day, that was last weekend, but it's kind of the unofficial start to summer, if you would. Anybody excited about hot dogs and hamburgers, pool parties and flip-flops? Some of you don't need to get them flip-flops out just yet. You need to make sure you get your pedicure done first. I'm not talking to this section of the room, but summer is here. Somebody praise God that the heat is on, that the cold days are behind us, and warmer weather is on our side. And my kids love summertime. Anybody else a fan of summer? Kind of like Olaf from Frozen. He just can't wait to get in the heat of summer. Even though it may make him a puddle, he doesn't care about that. He just loves to be in the, the season that we are in right now. And if you don't understand the Olaf uh, analogy, then you don't have children under the age of 10. Because every kid knows frozen. But it's summertime, and, and one of the things about summertime that we, we tend to do in our culture and in and, 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 and this day and age is, is we go on vacation. Does anybody have your, your vacation trips planned? Oh, I see Miss Joanna Ridgeway. She's waving her hand. She's about to shout and take a lap because she can't wait for her vacation. Her breakthrough is coming. But vacation, anybody looking forward to your vacation time? You're looking forward to that time where you get a chance to get away, put your feet up for a little bit, get a nice little relaxation by the swimming pool. Now, in days gone by, we used to invite our friends and family over to show all of our obnoxious pictures of our trip. But we don't have to do that any longer because we have technology, Instagram. Any Instagrammers in the room tonight? Follow me, Manny underscore Gonzalez, 888, shameless plug. Just go ahead and give me a follow if you don't already. But we, we have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have Twitter. We have all these different media outlets to, to show our vacation and our good times. But if I could just for a little bit, I want to go back to the old days and, and let's just make this our faux living room. And I, I went on a trip not too long ago. 
to start my summer off the right way, I went on a trip with a few of my friends to Washington, D.C. Anybody ever been to the Capitol? I tell you, it's a great trip. It's an amazing trip. But, and I got some slides, and if it's okay, I'm just going to bore you with some of my obnoxious pictures. And, and, and I want to show you my trip. Can, can we get those up there? Uh, uh, picture number one. Oh. <laughs> Me and my friends, man, we, we had a good time. That, that's us in front of the White House. Actually, I think that's behind the White House and, and me and my, my friends and some new friends that we met along the way. Next picture, please. Oh, yeah. Capitol Hill, nothing like it in the world. Amazing, their legislation is, is happening right before our very own eyes. Right there on Capitol Hill, there, there we go. Go next one, next one, next one, next one, please. The Washington Monument. We learned some things about the Washington Monument while we were there, and, and my friends were there. And, and go ahead and go to the next one, please. Oh. The Supreme Court. Oh, man, we need to pray for our Supreme Court justices, amen? We need to pray for those that, that judge and rule this land. And, and there we are, we're, we're at the Supreme Court. Go ahead and go to the next picture. Oh. The Iwo Jima War Memorial. It was amazing. It was awesome. Pretty cool. Next one. The Lincoln Memorial. Man, amazing. Next one. Next one, please. Oh, the selfie time. There's me and brother and sister Boggs, Chris and Kelly Boggs. There we are at the Ford's Theater. That was pretty amazing. That was pretty awesome. Go ahead and go to the next one. Had to get a few more friends in the picture. Oh. Elder... Eggfeld and pastor at the Iwo Jima Memorial. One more, one more, please. One more, one more, please. I think this is my favorite. There's a real good friend that we just met there. He looks thrilled to be in Washington, D.C., doesn't he, everybody? Now, you probably realize by now that I was in Washington, but my friend here wasn't. He was in the picture, but he wasn't in the picture. Somebody say, talk to me, Manny. Go ahead and you can go ahead and take those slides off there. Go ahead and say, talk to me, Manny. See, sometimes we get so caught up in a world of Photoshop, making people see what we want them to see, that we lose sight of what is authentic and what is fake. Oh, let me just help you out a little bit. Many of us have Jesus in the picture, but he's not in focus. I believe it's time for us to get back to authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't give me the phony. Don't give me anything less than real. I've got to have Jesus and nothing but Jesus. Can the church say amen? Many of us, we know who St. Patrick is. We have a day in March that... We all wear green, but St. Patrick was a man of God. And St. Patrick had a mission in his life to bring Ireland to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And on the inside of his breastplate, he had this engraved. Knowing that he was going to stand before a wicked king and present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Knowing that his very life was in danger. Here's... What St. Patrick said and what he had engraved on his breastplate. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my left. Christ on my right. When I lay down, let there be Christ. When I sit down, let there be Christ. Christ when I arise. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of every person who speaks of me. Christ in the, in the ear of every person that hears me. It's time that we don't just serve a God about what he can do for us. But it's time we serve a God that goes before us, that is around us, that's to our left, that's to our right, that surrounds us everywhere that we go. Even when we stand in danger, we still know it's all about Jesus never changed in over 2,000 years the gospel still has the power 
But sometimes we complicate this thing. And we make it about other things. We make it about the foolish. We make it about ourselves. But what we have to do is we've got to get back to authenticity in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 9 says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to that which is good. I like how the message puts it. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. We've been redeemed. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Our sins are behind us. And we stand here today redeemed because of the price that Jesus paid on Calvary's hill. But redemption isn't just about being purchased back, but about being brought back to our original value. We're the heirs of God. We are the sons and the daughters of a living God. We are the ones that have been called for such a time as this. Heaven went bankrupt to give us everything. And we take hold of that which is in Jesus Christ. You're an overcomer tonight. You're healed tonight. You're redeemed tonight. You're healed tonight. You're delivered tonight. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get you to remember who you are in Christ. Don't settle for a fake facade. Be a Christian. And Christians are bold. Christians are victorious. Christians live with authority and power. See, that's what the enemy did in the garden. He tried to get us to not believe or forget who it is we are in God. Did God really say? Did God really say? And he does the same trick time and time again. And he comes and whispers in the ears of the believer. Did God really say you were going to be whole? Did God really say that relationship was going to be put back together? Did God really say, I'm going to bless you? And we begin to lose sight of what really matters most. And when the storms come, we found that our foundation isn't built upon the rock, but our foundation is built upon sand. And we walk out the doors and we point a finger at God and say, it's your fault. But here's what we have the good news of. Our love is sincere. We have hope in Jesus Christ that no matter what hell may try to throw against us, we can know that the rock that is Jesus isn't going anywhere. That when the storms come blowing, we'll be able to stand strong because it's not in what I can do. It's not in what you can do. It's not in what the organization can do. It's in what Jesus did for me 2,000 years ago. And he bled on a cross, broken, dying, wheezing. He died for you and for me. And so when you get the report when you don't see your kids living right when you feel the stress the economy's falling apart craziness has happened it's not the time to run away from what's authentic it's time to grab hold of what's authentic and let that continue to be the foundation on which we grow we know this one thing to be true. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. But yet we want the deep things. We want the deep things. And there's nothing wrong with going deep. I think it's great to go deep. But let's remember the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it's the gospel and it's simplistic work in our life that's going to get us through Monday, through Saturday. It's when we can know it may not look right, but I know my God can. I know my God will because he already did. The simplicity 
of the gospel is where we find the power. Not in by anything that we possess, not in by any knowledge that we have, but in the simple fact that Jesus died, rose again, and now we have access to God. And he came to bring us back to that place. Redemption, I want to say it again, isn't just about being purchased back. That's great that you've been purchased back, but, but some of us, we were purchased back and we had some, some battle wounds. We had some scars of what the world did to us. We were tainted and we were broken and we were confused and we were damaged good. But he didn't just redeem you just to put you back. He redeemed you to put you back to the original value. The original value that's found in the garden of Jesus Christ where we have authority. He didn't just bring us back. He brought us back and brought us to that original value. I don't know about you tonight, but I have a hunger. I have a desire for something authentic, for something that is genuine, for something that is undisputed, for something that is real. We live in a day and age where we see people and youth and, and this world starving for truth. The truth is Jesus, and we have that. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Authenticity is what we're looking for. Authenticity holds weight. Authenticity brings value. But here's something that we've got to understand. Authenticity is born in a place of vulnerability. Authenticity is born in a place of vulnerability. See, that's why I love times when we get in here and the presence of God just fills this place and we just step into worship. And many of us, we know how to pray. And we can run, we can dance, we can shout, and I thank God for the high praise. But there's times in our life where we have to be still and worship and the reason why some of us can't enter into worship or we get bored in those times and our mind begins to wander and we begin to think of all the checklists that we have to do and we think come on organ player can't you just give me a little b3 is because worship requires something of you worship replaces the object of my affection and if we're being honest in the room tonight, if we're being vulnerable in the room tonight, oftentimes the object of our affection is right here. Me. I'm the object of my affection. You're the object of your affection. And so the reason why we don't want to step into worship is because it replaces that and it makes him the king and author of our life. And it's in worship that we're changed forever. Why? Because we've become vulnerable. We've let something else take the place. It strips us of everything that we hold on to. And that's our human nature is we want to hold on to me and my identity and what I want and what I think and what I have to say and my opinion. It strips us of everything that we hold on to. Our will, our pride, what we think ought to happen. And so often we can hide behind our personality and our talent. But worship brings us to a place where we're confronted with our weaknesses. Where we're confronted and we see the man in the mirror and we see every fault. Because when we put ourselves up against the mighty God, we see really where we rank. And we see that it needs to be changed on the inside of me. There has to be action after I leave this place. There has to be something that I have to do. I'm now responsible for the information that I've been given. And that's what worship does. Worship reveals who we really are. Authenticity. Authenticity. Something genuine. Something real. Second so Chronicles 12.9. I'm going to say this a little different than what we typically say it. In my weakness, he's made strong. 
But I need somebody to know this tonight. God isn't impressed by your strengths. He's much more interested in your weaknesses. Because it's in your weaknesses that he's made strong. It's in your weaknesses that he's been able to be God in your life. It's when you can't get around and you can't function, but you have the knowledge enough to say, Jesus! Not me, but you. Not me, but you. Not me, but you. In my weakness. That's where he's made strong. And so many of us, we try to hide our weaknesses. Our human nature is to not show weakness because weakness makes us threatened. Our weaknesses to others make us feel vulnerable. You've ever heard the expression, don't let them see you sweat. Well, tonight you're seeing me sweat a little bit. Don't let them see you sweat. Don't let them know that you're weak. Don't let them know. But it's completely opposite in the kingdom of God. Because here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, give me your burdens. Give me your failures. Give me your pain. Don't hold on to it any longer. But in your weakness, I am made strong. And that's where you have the victory, brother and sister, in our weakness. And we can say, God, here I am. God, here I am. I am. And so many of us, we, we never experience genuine freedom because we never get to that place. We never get to that place where we let it go because we hold on to it. It becomes our identity. It becomes who we are. It's a part of my personality. It's a part of my persona. It's who they think that I am. It's who I'm supposed to be. Time and time again, I've dealt with young people and I've dealt with people who are so bound and addicted by something and it has become their identity. Now, you don't understand, this is who I am. I was born this way. I'm gonna tell you right now, that's a lie from the pit of hell. You were born fearfully and wonderfully made and you have a purpose and no matter what the world says about you, you are his. And there's nothing that you can do that can keep you away from him. We buy that lie so, so often today, this morning, even in our service, I was able to stand with a young lady who was just, just tormented. You could just feel it. I've done too much. I've gone too far. There's no way. And I went back and I said, this is your moment. This is your time to get it right. No words that I said that made her come under the power of the conviction, but it was the Holy Spirit at work in me, through me. And with tears streaming on her face, she said, you're right. You're right, I gotta face the man in the mirror. I've gotta face my weaknesses. I've gotta take hold of the strength that is found in Jesus. Stop fighting the battle that you weren't meant to fight in the first place. But so many of us never experience true and genuine freedom. We continue to find ourselves limping around the same issues, dealing with the same things, our minds sidetracked by late night uh, internet searches. And we wonder, God, I want freedom from this thing. But we don't do the things that's necessary for him to bring freedom because we still hold on to it. We deliberately Choose not to take hold of the hand of God. And what that is simply, church, is that is pride. And what we've got to learn to do is we've got to learn to crucify our flesh and say, it's not what I want. It's not what I think, but it's about what the king thinks. I am his, and it's under his authority that I've been sent, and I can't let anything, anything dilute the anointing that is upon my life. Coming to a place of vulnerability. Coming to a place of humility. We say, I got this. But we don't have it. It has us. But here's the good news. Is brokenness does something in the life of a believer. Brokenness brings multiplication. It was five loaves and two fish that were 
first broken and then multiplied. It was the body of our Savior that was beaten and bruised. But because of his death, we've been made heirs. And multiplication has happened and we are a force to be reckoned with. Brokenness brings multiplication. So don't be afraid to get vulnerable in the presence of God because when you get vulnerable and you get humbled, then God can really begin to work. Authenticity also requires a premium. This thing that we have costs something. It's not just about coming and saying a prayer and walking back to our seat. It's about life change. Saying, lead me, guide me, direct me, go before me, stay behind me on my left and on my right. Saying yes to Jesus is an all or nothing situation. You can't pick and choose which frames of life you want him in. You can't pick and choose. Well, I think I want it right here. There it is. I want it right here. There it is. Oh, oh, somebody's looking at work. I can't live that life. What I pray for our church is that we step into a baptism of boldness. We want to see this place packed out again. Let the saints of God get bold. Let them get full of fire. Let them be tenacious. Let us begin to push the plate back, cry out, say, God, we want revival. We need revival. We won't leave until you show yourself. We won't leave until you make yourself known. I won't leave until you save my kids. I won't leave until you heal my body. I won't leave until you send your fire. But that requires something of you and me. That requires something of you and me. Letting our pride go. Less of me and more of you. Authenticity is effective. And I want at the end of my life, not for men to know the name Manny Gonzalez, but I want at the end of my life to be, have been effective for the kingdom of God. And we've got too many people wanting to be known by men, but not known in heaven. I want to be effective on this earth. If I never have a platform to preach, I want to preach with my life. If I never have the opportunity to lay hands in a service, I want the shadow that I possess to heal people when I walk by them in the grocery store. I want to be effective for the kingdom of God. And that comes through a place of authenticity. Authenticity. I want us to learn to be allergic to the counterfeit. Be allergic to the counterfeit. El El Elder Mike, I know you got some money on you. Bring me a dollar bill or two. How many appreciate your elders in this church? I thank God for men of God that stand behind our pastor. Now, here I got a nice crisp, two nice crisp, $20. Bills, it's all about the Jacksons, baby. <laughs> now, I could go to a store and say, I'm going to pay with this piece of paper. And they're going to look at me and say, you've been on some bath salts, son. <laughs> because this isn't anything. There's nothing authentic about this piece of paper. Other than the little scribbles and handwritings that I have on them. But when I go to the store and I pay with this, guess which is more effective? That which has the authority of the government behind it. And what you have to realize is that when you stand up in boldness, you have the authority of the kingdom of God behind you. And so when you speak a thing, a thing happens. 
I didn't know if I was in a room tonight with anybody that had some struggles, that needed to speak some things, that needed the authority of God to rest upon your life. Maybe you need a promotion on your job. Speak it. If you're authentic, you can speak it. If you've got the real thing, you can stand in it. I need healing in my body. I've got the word of God behind me that says, by his stripes I am healed. My kids are out living in the world. I've got the word of God behind me that says, the, me and my house will serve the Lord. Get behind me, devil. I'm authentic to the bone. I want to be effective for the kingdom. I want to be effective for the kingdom. I want to be effective for the kingdom. I want to be able to walk into a Sunday school class and raise up future prophets. Hey! See, so many of us are trying to get noticed by somebody else. And if we realize if we just have the audience of one... I don't need you to notice me because my father noticed me. He gave me breath this morning and wherever I go, I've got revival in my hand. A chain reaction happened in the life of Billy Graham. Many of us, we know the name Billy Graham. Billy Graham in his lifetime, in his lifetime has, has preached to over 2.2 billion people. We know who Billy Graham is. But there was a chain reaction. And you never know where God's going to place you, Joshua. You never know where God is going to put you. And you've got to be faithful to the mission that he's given for your life. See, there was a Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball, the Sunday school teacher, modest, meek, faithful. Thank God for faithful Sunday school workers and kid harvest workers who work week in and week out to bring a harvest of souls to the kingdom of God. Edward Kimball helped lead Dwight L. Moody to Christ. D.L. Moody was one of the largest evangelists of his time and brought the gospel to two continents. In one of those meetings, a man by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman was converted. J. Wilbur Chapman got so full of fire that he wanted to take the call of God in his life and he set out for full-time ministry. And he began to preach here in America. In America, one day, there was a professional baseball player who had a day off. And instead of going to a bar or a tavern, he decided to go to this meeting that was going on. This baseball player was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday, who became one of America's foremost evangelists in his day and age, got radically transformed by this man's message and was converted. Billy Sunday began to hold meetings across America. And there was a gentleman in one of his meetings by the name of Mordecai Ham. And Mordecai Ham was converted at Billy Sunday's meeting. And Mordecai Ham was in North Carolina in the countryside was known often for being radical and full of boldness and oftentimes would go and rent a hearse and put his a billboard meeting tonight. This young man heard about such a meeting and said, I've got to check this thing out. I, I've got to see if this is legit. I've got to go and I've got to see. He was compelled in that meeting. Didn't make a decision that night but wrestled the whole time because he thought, how can this person tell me that I'm lost? Tell me that I'm confused. And so he went back the next night and this time the Holy Spirit captured his heart and he came down to an altar and said a sinner's prayer and Babe Ruth was replaced in that man's life by Jesus Christ as his hero. That man was Billy Graham. But it all started with the simple obedience of Edward Kimball. Effectiveness, effectiveness for the kingdom of God. What if Edward Kimball wouldn't have been in his place? 
we would have never had a D.L. Moody. We would have never had a J. Wilbur Chapman. We never would have had a Billy Sunday. We never would have never had a Mordecai Ham. We would have never had a Billy Graham. And 2.2 billion people would have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. A lot is spoken about our Christian disciplines. Prayer is vital to the life of a believer. Without a prayer life, you don't have power. And we've got to consecrate ourselves and pray. A lot is spoken about church attendance and worship. And that's another essential for the life of a believer. But I think the third thing that's equally as essential is Christian service. What impact are you making on your world today? Because authentic Christians are effective. Authentic Christians see the miracles, see the signs, see the wonders. And James is describing Abraham and he says in Abraham or in James 2, 20 and 22, faith and action work together to perfect our faith. Church, I want my faith to be perfected. I don't want to be incomplete, but I want to be perfected in the kingdom. I want to be authentic. I want to be genuine. I want to God, I want God to use me to do great and mighty things. What does it mean to have our faith perfected? Perfect to accomplish the assigned task. What has God called you to? What has God called you to? God, I want my life to be used for the glory. I want my life to be used to usher in your presence. I've got to have it. It's not just a need, but Lord, it's a want. I've got to have it. If I don't get it, I can't go on any longer. But most importantly, God, I want to bring somebody to you. Stand all across this room tonight. I feel the Holy Spirit in this place. If you have a prayer language right now, it would be a good time to begin to open that up and begin to pray to heaven. God, make us authentic. Let us not settle for phony, fake Christianity, but God, let us, let us make a difference in the world in which you've called us to live. Right now, I believe that God has given assignments this week. You didn't just come to this service tonight just to hear something that would tickle your ears, but you came here tonight so that God can get you to this moment. There's somebody in this room tonight that's going to lead somebody to the Lord this week. You've been afraid and you've been held back. But tonight you've received the boldness because you've been willing to step into his presence and you've been willing to be vulnerable. So right now with every eye closed and hand lifted before a mighty God, I want us just to take a moment and worship because I believe in this time God will reveal himself to you. He'll reveal your assignment. God, use us, use us, use us, use us, use us, use us, oh God. Oh God, let us be the ones that usher in revival. Let us be faithful and diligent. Do not find us lackadaisical, but God. Oh, we want to know you. We want to know you, Jesus. Jesus.